Yes, good morning everyone in and around the courtroom. This is case IT0891T, the prosecutor versus Mr. Stanisch and Mr. Andrew Plenian. Like this one? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Madam Registrar. Um, as would be observed, we're getting used to the new technology. Uh, may we have the appearances, please? Good morning, Your Honours. The OTP this morning, um, Joanna Corner, and starting with the most important person in the case, um, Sebastian von Hoydonk, the case manager, uh, then Alex de Mergen, uh, Matthew Olmsted, and I think a new face, Your Honours, but a member of the team for some time now. Rafael La Cruz and an intern, Lucy Eastwood, sitting at the back. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honours. Slobodan Zevcevic, Slobodan Cjepic, Eugene O'Sullivan, Ms. Tatiana Savic, and Andrea Zevcevic appearing for Stanisic's defense this morning. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Your Honours. Dragan Kargovic, <laughs> Alexander Alexic, Michelle Butler. Miroslav Chuskic, David Martini, Milana Judovic, and Joyce Bukestein appearing for Jupin defense team tomorrow, today. <laughs> Thank you. So, of course, according to the um, scheduling order, we're here today to begin um, the closing submissions, and we would invite the OTP to begin. Your Honours, before I do that, um, I sent an email uh, yesterday to the senior legal officer, although I gather he's not here, uh, but copied to other legal officers in respect of the question of matters of law contained within the defence final briefs uh, with which we took issue and whether it would be possible to deal with those matters, because they're not really the purpose of a final address, um, in writing. Um, Where Your Honours given um, notification of this application? Um, Your Honours, Mr. Zetchevich objects, and I'm assuming the objection um, is also maintained on behalf of the Zhuplinin team, um, effectively on the basis that once the final it's gone off has it <laughs> oh yes I'm told the new microphones are actually less sensitive than the old ones um, so your honors uh, our application this morning is simply this there are not many but there are some matters of law which we say um, the defense have made an error about, uh, and we would simply ask that we can deal with that um, in writing. Uh, and no doubt, if your honors agree to that, OLAD would clearly fund um, a response from the defense. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I hear what you have said about the funding issue but do I understand correctly, and perhaps Mr. Zetchevich could confirm this, that the objection is only based on the funding issue and not on any um, um, issue of procedural principle? Because the, as far as the, the initial view of the trial chamber is that this is a matter that is can be disposed of in terms of the ordinary principles of how these ma how, how um, closings are conducted without venturing into this matter of, of funding, which uh, ordinarily is in the concern of the trial chamber. Your Honor, my thank you. Uh, my my objection has nothing to, with, to do with the funding. Uh, I, perhaps that's a misunderstanding by Ms. Corner. My objection was the, was the following. 
We believe that the, uh, the trial chamber has given ample time for the parties to address all the matters in, uh, in fact and law during the closing arguments. And uh, we believe we should, we should do that in the oral arguments. Furthermore, I added that once the closing is done, the defense team, according to the OLAD policy, does not exist anymore. Therefore, it would be a certain problem for us to 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 deal with the with the uh, with the written uh, written uh, submissions after the close. Of, of course, I assume that this problem can be overcome, but then it will require additional. Uh, uh, additional time for us to, to discuss that with OLAD and how to do it. And, uh, and uh, by, the, by the way, a, a, a member of, uh, of defense teams have been uh, put on notice that uh, that's uh, after the 1st of June that there will be no longer needed and uh, people have made some, uh, some uh, plans to come home, go home and so on and so forth. But uh, we are in the hands of your honors. I, I mean, it's, it's not the, the problem that we cannot overcome. We just believe that uh, it would, it, we have uh, enough time, both parties, to, to address these issues during the oral arguments. Thank you very much. Mr. Kukovic, you adopt what Mr. Zetjevic has yes, said, Your I Honor. Uh, it was joint submission by both defense teams. Uh, Ms. Corner, could I, could I hear you further on the procedural aspect? Um, put aside the funding business. Your Honours, the, the, there is, um, there are a number of possibilities uh, in respect of final briefs, and one of those possibilities is uh, that there's a response to the final briefs, a written response. Um, Your Honours uh, decided not to, to afford us the opportunity, which we accept. Um, there are, as Your Honours will hear, we say many um, defects in, in, in what's asserted in some of the, the, the final briefs, but it's the, the only matter that I'm concerned about is the fact of the law. Um, this is the final oral address is an opportunity, an opportunity for both sides to deal with the factual matters that they wish your honours to take away with them uh, and also the only chance the public gets to hear them. It doesn't seem to us that it's helped by an arid discussion of whether or not the aspects. I don't, I don't think the new and replacement microphones are <laughs> very effective. Um, so that's the situation, um, Your Honours. Well, we have heard the parties and we would um, uh, give this consideration and um, return with a ruling, probably oral, in the course of today or certainly by tomorrow, first thing tomorrow. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Corner, are you Thank you, otherwise honest. ready to begin? I, I... Yes, it is on. Um, Your Honours, can we start by saying that, as I more or less just said, that the purpose of our closing address today is to highlight um, some of the matters that we have dealt with at far greater length in the uh, final trial, and obviously to deal with some of the matters uh, that have been raised by both accused in their final trial briefs. Uh, can I explain that as has happened through the trial, uh, there will be a, a division of labor um, uh, for the purposes of this oral address. Uh, once I've dealt with some preliminary matters, Mr. Demergian uh, will deal with the municipalities uh, that your honors have heard about in this case. Uh, I will then deal with some of the background and the question of resubordination. Uh, 
from there we move to the uh, liability of Stoy and Juplinin. We are, as it were, building this address in the same way that we built the final trial brief. Um, Mr. Um, who's not here at the moment but will be appearing later, <laughs> um, will deal with communications, which is obviously an important aspect, highlighted by both defence in their briefs, uh, the liability of Micho Stanisic, uh, and Mr. Olmsted will then deal, as he has dealt through most of the trial, with the failure to investigate and to prosecute, uh, which we say uh, applies to both these accused. And finally, Your Honours, to round off, as it were, all the themes together in one short topic, uh, the, we will deal with the killings that took place at Koryachansky Skjene. Well, can I just say a few general words um, about the defence final briefs? In, in our submission, uh, they invite a very careful reading. There are, we would suggest, a number of lacunae uh, in these briefs. For example, propositions are made uh, without any citation. There are assertions of fact uh, about which uh, Your Honours have heard no evidence at all. And Your Honours, can I take one very simple straightforward an immediate example of that it may not be the most important but it's we say unfortunately symptomatic um, your honors in the Juplinin um, final brief at paragraph one sort of paragraph it may not be vital but it's important um, it is asserted that Stoyan Joplinin uh, was born on the 22nd of September 1951 as an only child to a poor rural family. Well, Your Honours, we've checked very carefully um, and we find no evidence at all um, that he was an only child to a poor rural family. And as I say, it, it begins, Your Honour, as it, as it carries on. Um, Your Honour, in paragraph 201, <laughs> where the brief uh, is dealing with the special police, to which I will obviously be returning when I come to deal with Mr. Zhupanin's um, authority over them. Uh, it states, while they suggested uh, contacting Zhupanin, and this is to do with complaints about the behavior, to address these problems, this was simply because he was known as the head of the CSB and he was the most convenient point of contact uh, in the area. And the undefined nature of the unit also made it difficult uh, for the Cotavirus crisis staff to know whom to address their complaints. Well, you know, that the, <laughs> there's not one iota of evidence uh, to that effect. Um, and, Your Honours, finally, if one looks at the uh, Stanisic uh, final brief, at paragraph 53... You know, this, this goes to the no sites and assertion of facts. Um, but, but we say not in evidence. Some 2,000 Serb employ MUP employees were dismissed to recruit and employ Muslim policemen on the pretext that it was necessary to achieve ethnic balance between the service. There's absolutely no site for that proposition. Uh, the next part, uh, for which there is a site, 
uh, is uh, to Mr. Andan, and that doesn't in any way uh, deal with that assertion there at the beginning of paragraph 53. Your Honours, further, we say that uh, there are really misleading assertions, uh, regrettably, in the brief. Your Honours, sticking with the Stanisic brief for the moment, paragraph 99. This comes under the section which is headed the previous page, no plan to split the MUP. And they uh, say at the end of the paragraph, uh, having the, the document that they're with is in fact 1D116. And it says, the document highlights the major problem created by the SDA leadership by pushing the MUP into a conflict with the JNA. This was done in part by the takeover of military records uh, for the creating of an armed force to confront the army. Your Honours, I'm going to ask that we put up 1D116, please. or part of it. This was a public announcement. I've got the whole document. Um, if your honours, look, this was the, the BIH MUP making a public announcement about the statement made by Dr. Karadich, and at the end and they list their complaints, uh, we see uh, it's the penultimate paragraph with a dash, creating an anti-army atmosphere which is apparent in the MUP written order to engage the police in preventing the JNA from taking over military records. So, what was happening there was that they were preventing uh, the JNA not taking over the military. The reason we're giving a few examples of this stage is simply so that when reading these briefs, uh, your honours do check the various sites. Uh, can I take one example of this uh, from these Joplinin final brief, paragraph uh, 235. Uh, this, Your Honour, um, is part of the um, can anybody call it a diatribe? I'll come back to that. That the, the, the Joplin final brief engages in against uh, Mr. Brown, uh, the military expert. And they say there that uh, prosecution expert Brown was forced to concede that an order issued by General Talich provided that police in exceptional circumstances may be used in a variety of different ways to support the army and that, importantly, they may be used for combat activities uh, without forming MUP organs um, or obtaining their... And the site there is for um, Mr. Brown's evidence. Um, and pursuant to Talich's order, discretion to resubordinate police in such circumstances was vested in the army. Such exceptional circumstances, i.e. war were in fact the norm through the indictment period. Now, the suggestion that is made is that is what Mr. Brown said. In fact, uh, that was not what Mr. Brown said. Uh, Mr. Brown gave an example 
of exceptional circumstances. I just for a moment find the passage. Um, which uh, is not cited. Uh, it's, it begins at the bottom of T189, uh, 16. And he said about the exceptional circumstances, I would read this as bearing in mind the context of the time and this comes in the middle of the corridor operation. Uh, but this is relating to the front line. Uh, I have maybe mentioned this in direct front line combat tasks, for example, that were occurring in the Corps in that time in the corridor. And that in exceptional circumstances, presumably he means here, if there is a weakness in the front line or there's attack uh, by the enemy formation, that in exceptional circumstances police can be used, but there are limitations and that they are to hold and strengthen the front prior to the arrival of military units. So in essence, it's to plug a front line if there's a problem. And he goes on to say, page 18949, so I read this document in the context of what was ha ha happening in the corridor. Uh, he did not say that exceptional circumstances were war. And, of course, the defense used that to show that war means um, that at all stages uh, the army could resubordinate uh, the police. And Your Honours, I will, as I say, come back to that. Your Honours, uh, there are sentences taken out of context. Judge Harhoff, who's quoted with approval at paragraph 420, may wish to read uh, what he said before and after uh, the page uh, that is uh, quoted. Uh, and finally, Your Honours, what uh, we would call false syllogisms. Um, your Honours, it is particularly uh, noted uh, in paragraph 282 of the Jupelin in Brief. And uh, I'm sure Your Honours are aware of what a syllogism is. I'm having difficulty in saying it myself. Um, You know, it's a paragraph 282, and we're still dealing with resubordination. The defense assert that. Uh, this is following on from the law of internal affairs and the Geneva Conventions, that any involvement by civilian police in arresting, detaining, interrogating suspects during an armed conflict occurred outside the legal parameters of normal police duties. These are military tasks. It follows that the only situation in which the police could be ordered to engage in such tasks would be if they were resubordinated uh, to the army. Once this happened, military rules and laws applied to the in individual police officers involved. In, in other words, and what we say is the false syllogism is, the, the, the police um, are not allowed to uh, guard prisoners by law. Uh, the military are, ergo, if the police were guarding Therefore, they must be resubordinated. And as I'm sure your honours can see, there's a, there's a definite missing link there. Um, 
because the obvious answer is, well, by law they may have been not allowed to do it. That doesn't mean they didn't. Uh, it does not automatically follow um, that uh, they were uh, re-subordinated. Your Honours, two other matters before um, I invite... Um, Mr. Demergen to tell your honours about what we say about municipalities. Um, the defence, not surprisingly, rely very heavily uh, on the witnesses who were former senior members of the MUP um, and who came to testify. Um, largely for, for the prosecution. Um, as we said in our final brief, it's for your honours, of course, to assess um, the weight and the truthfulness of, of that evidence. But, of course, most of them, if not all, had been interviewed by the Office of the Prosecutor as suspects. Many of them were a clearly a party to what we say was the joint criminal enterprise, and all of them had their own interests to serve. Uh, and it's for your honours to assess, as, I, as we say, how much weight you give their evidence. Uh, the second matter is this. Um, in, in one sense, the defence have had the advantage of being able to blame dead men, in particular uh, Mr. Drilarcha and uh, 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 Todorovic, and the advantage that in the dock in the, with uh, both these accused has been nobody uh, who represented either the military or the political side. And the third thing, Your Honours, is this. In the defence pretrial briefs, both the original and the supplementary ones which were ordered, there is not a hint, Your Honour, of one of the major defences that has been run in this case. Um, the fact that both accused were going to be saying as a major plank of their case that neither of them had authority over the members of the RS MUP who committed crimes as anything between 80 and 100%, and I'll come to those calculations later, were resubordinated at the time of the crimes being committed, uh, whether they were in takeovers or guarding camps. Uh, the nearest that one comes in any of the pretrial briefs was paragraph 17 of the Zhuplinin uh, uh, final uh, pretrial brief where he stated that the role of the police was minor in comparison with the role of the army uh, and uh, that his Zhuplin's de jure position did not con correspond with his de facto power. And your honours are entitled to ask why such a major plank of the defence was never mentioned in either um, pretrial brief. Your honours, finally, can I turn to the municipalities? Your honours, we are going to address in the beginning the events there for the following reasons. The crimes for which the accused, we say, are criminally liable happened there. The evidence shows a pattern which leads to the irresistible inference that these crimes happened by design, or these events happened by design, not chance, but they are both widespread and systematic. And because the only mention of the victims, really, in this case has come through the defence attempts 
to challenge the evidence that named victims either died as a result of the crimes or challenging their civilian status by saying, by seeking to say, that at some time or other those victims had been members of the opposing forces. And as your honours know, we say without any proper justification for so saying. The victims of these crimes were the reason for the establishment of uh, this court. As one sees on the poster coming in to the uh, lobby of this building, bringing war criminals to justice and justice to victims. And the nature of trials of high-level accused means that unlike the earlier trials at this court, their voices, the voices of the victims, have not been heard. And the most that really Your Honours heard from victims of these crimes was from those who came to deal with disputed or disallowed adjudicated facts. And regrettably, because of the time limitations and, and those limitations, in fact, were quite often not able to explain to the court when they tried uh, about what personally happened to them. And so we start, uh, we hope, um, properly by reminding uh, the court of the municipalities. Good morning, Your Honours. As announced by Ms. Corner, I will be dealing with the pattern of the evidence uh, that emerged out of the municipalities in this case. Before I deal with the specifics, it is useful to uh, remind ourselves of uh, some of the context in which the pattern developed. They are, as Bosnia and Herzegovina declared its independence, and with the likelihood of international recognition, the Bosnian Serb leadership opposed an independent Bosnia and decided to create a separate Serb state on large parts of Bosnia's territory. Now, to achieve this, the Serb leadership created a parallel government and forcibly removed hundreds of thousands of Muslims and Croats in what turned out to be a well-developed and deliberate plan. The crimes that came about as a result of this plan follow a clear pattern, showing that the crimes charged in the indictment were not committed in isolation, but rather were guided by a common theme. Looking at the pattern inevitably means looking at the evidence of victims who came to The Hague to recount what must have been the worst experiences of their lives. We will look at what they said in court and what contemporaneous documents tell us about the emergence of this pattern. The first aspect I would like to deal with is the arming of Serbs prior to the beginning of the conflict. Your Honours, there is no dispute that Muslims and Croats sought the independence of Bosnia and Herzegovina and that Bosnian Serbs opposed it. However, the accused have alleged in their defense that all sides were arming themselves as ethnic groups became suspicious of one another. They have also alleged that the Bosnian Serbs leadership's actions were merely reactive or defensive. They claim they did not share the intent of forcibly removing Muslims and Croats, and that what occurred in 1992 was a byproduct of the conflict. As your honors will have seen from our final brief, the evidence tells a different story. The prosecution does not claim that Muslims and Croats were not arming themselves. However, it is submitted that the Bosnian Serbs prepared themselves not to defend against Muslim or Croat physical aggression, but rather to implement their objective <coughs> by force after the loss of their political battle in blocking the recognition of Bosnia and Herzegovina as a sovereign state. 
Several speeches made during Serb assembly sessions prior to the conflict make it clear that the Bosnian Serb leadership had in mind to conquer by force large portions of Bosnia's territory. Momčilo Krajišnik said very clearly during the eighth session when he stated the following. Gentlemen, we want to remain in a single state together with Serbia, Montenegro, the independent autonomous region of Kraina, now the Kraina state, and the rest. We just need to agree on the method to achieve this. If we don't want this to be by certain methods, let us put a stop to it. You know what our profession has always been, to wage war. It is against this background that the Bosnian Serbs armed themselves. During the pre-conflict period, the Bosnian Serb leadership requested the assistance of the JNA. Indeed, during the session of December 11, 1991, Kryashnik highlighted the necessity to address the demand to the JNA, stressing its obligation to protect the territories, and I quote, we have proclaimed an integral part of the federal state. By this time, Your Honors, the republics were virtually left without any weapons, as military weapons and equipment from the TO warehouses had already been removed by the JNA by the end of 1990. What followed was a systematic distribution of weapons throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina by the JNA. Weapons were distributed to local SDS committees in Bosnian Serb claimed territories. This was a well orchestrated operation and involved the use of trucks and helicopters. For example, in Priedor, many members of the 5th Kozaraz Brigade returned from the Croatian battlefront and kept their weapons at home. Shipments of weapons were delivered by trucks and helicopters during spring of 92 in the Serb villages of Balte, Petrovgai, and Chirkin Polje. The Serb staff members of the SJB used the premises of the social center in Chirkin Polje to store weapons. In his end of year report, Simo Durlaca reported that the focus of the work was on the covert organization and formation of shadow police stations and the arming and equipping of the personnel. In this manner, 13 police stations were established with a total of about 1,500. Weapons, ammunition, and other material were acquired from various sources. The army was the primary source. And secretly, mostly at night, collected, transported, stored, and distributed to personnel for homekeeping and use. This is an exhibit P689. In Doboy, JNA barracks were located at the outskirts of town, with a military presence of the 6th Motorized Brigade, manned by about a thousand soldiers by the beginning of the conflict, and several other units, including a JNA artillery unit. Starting in October 1991, five or six, six volunteer detachments had been created by the JNA, each being manned by three to four hundred persons. They received their weapons from the JNA, and your honors have seen the receipts for such distribution uh, at exhibit P2446. Finally, in Zvornik, the SJB uh, reported in its end of the year report that working on various checkpoints during the months of January and February, police personnel of Serb nationality enabled the transport of weapons ammunition and other material and technical equipment necessary for the arming of the Serb people and the territory of this municipalities. Now, these are but a few examples, Your Honours, of how the Bosnian Serb leadership systematically organized the arming of the Serbs in towns and villages and municipalities claimed to be an integral part of Serb territory. I will now move on to the takeovers. Now, by the end of 1991, Your Honors, the Serb leadership had already created an assembly. They had indicated which municipalities fell under the territory they claimed to be Serb. If 
you'll remember after the plebiscite, they issued a decision confirming the territory of each SAO. They proclaimed on the 9th of January, 92, the Republic of the Serbian people in Bosnia and Herzegovina. In the following weeks, they adopted a constitution and the laws necessary to govern the Republic. All they needed was a green light to assume power over the claimed territories. That green light came on the 24th of March, the same day that Micho Stanisic was appointed Minister of Interior. During the 12th Assembly, Radovan Karadzic convinced the Assembly that they did not need a National Guard, like the one that was created in Croatia. Indeed, Karadzic was happy with having the JNA on his side, and he added that a National Guard was not necessary, as the numbers in the police are quite sufficient. He followed by uttering these prophetic words. First he said, we have a legal basis in the law on internal affairs. We also have the insignia. At a desired moment, and this will be very soon, we can form whatever we want. This could happen in two or three days. And at that moment, all the Serbian municipalities, both the old ones and the newly established ones, would literally assume control on the entire territory of the municipality concerned. Karadzic continues by stating that in Zvornik, control would be assumed over everything that constitutes the Serbian municipality of Zvornik. He continues by saying this, Then, at a given moment in the next three or four days, there will be a single method used and you will be able to apply it in the municipalities you represent, including both things that must be done as well as how to do them. How to separate the police, take the resources that belong to the Serbian people, and take command. Your Honours, it is no coincidence that Zvornik was forcibly taken over within weeks of this speech and was one of the first municipalities to be taken over. Now, takeovers seem to have followed a similar pattern depending on the level of control exerted by the Bosnian Serbs in each municipality. For example, in Pale and Bileca, which were Serb majority municipalities, Bosnian Serbs assumed power over municipal organs, such as the police, the assembly, and other institutions, several weeks before attacks took place on surrounding villages. Whereas in other municipalities, such as Sanski Most, Doboy, or Bosanski Shamats, the takeover was marked by an attack, an armed attack against vital institutions. The takeovers were conducted simultaneously over the course of three months. And this next animated slide um, will show you how these municipalities were taken over. The municipalities in the indictment on this map will be colored in red. In <coughs> Those that are not in the indictment will be colored in gray. The municipalities that are not in the, in the indictment for which we do have a takeover date will also be part of the chronology, whereas the rest will be highlighted at the end. Now, in the first animation, you can see that by the end of March, Pale, Ilyash, and Bielina had already been taken over. By the end of the first week of April, you can see that Banja Luka and Teslic have been taken over. By the end of the second week in April, Zvornik and Visegrad were taken over. By the end of the third week of April, Donny Vakuf, Bosanski Shamats, and Vlasenica were also taken over. And by the end of the fourth week in April, Priedor and Sanski Most fell as well. Hence, by the end of April 1992, 12 of the 19 charged municipalities were under Serb control. Now, by the end of the first week of May, Brčko, Doboj, Skandervakov, and Kluč were taken over. Following this, at the, by, by the end of May, pretty much every municipality in the ARC had been taken over, except for Kotorvaros. In the first week of June, Katsko was taken over, and this was followed by Bileča and Kotorvaros, which were both taken over by the middle of June. By the end of June, Modrica was taken over, and this marked the opening of the Pasovina Corridor. 
During the first week of July, Derventai has taken over, enlarging the corridor. And we will see that in October, Bosanski Brod has also taken over. By the end of the year, all the municipalities highlighted on this map were effectively under Serb control. Your honors may have already found that the takeovers have not been mentioned once in the Stanisic defense final brief. While Zhuplenin claims in his brief that the takeovers were conducted by the army and that the involvement of the police, if any, was in a resub resubordinated capacity. The evidence shows, Your Honor, is that in some cases, yes, the army did took part and led forcible takeovers, whereas in other cases, the army played no role whatsoever and is seen later taking part in joint attacks. We will start with Bielgina, which was, as you have seen already, taken over on the 31st of March and was the result of a combined attack involving the Serb TO, Mauser's National Guard, Arkhan's Volunteer Guard, with the support of the JNA. That day, the police had the role of protecting the vital facilities in town. Following the takeover, the SJB chief reported the following. I have managed to procure some of the equipment, berets, and badges with the tricolor from the Serbian MOOP, and our police officers have worn them since the first day when they, out, when they went out in the streets on the 4th of April, 92. Stories of civilians being arrested and mistreated in Bielina quickly circulated at the time and spread throughout the country. In the first days of the attack, 48 bodies had been picked up prior to Biljana Plavšić's visit on the 4th of April. In Zvornik, Your Honours, the takeover took place on the 8th of April, and by this time, the police had already split, and the Serb police force had established its headquarters in the Alhos factory, where the crisis staff and Arkhan's men were also stationed. Following an ultimatum issued by the Serb forces, the police, the TO, the JNA, and Arkhan's men launched their attack on Zvornik town. The attack on Zvornik was of great violence, as is best summarized by the UN envoy in the following clip. That day, a UN official was driving from Serbia to Bosnia. He was stopped just outside Svornik. Me crucé con un vehículo del Comité Internacional de Cruz Roja que me dijeron, no pases, no pases, eh, 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 tu le monde fou, eh? everybody is crazy. A paramilitary commander, proud of his work, let in a news crew. Here, the regime of terror is being established as military police try to identify the Muslims. Era un grado de tensión absolutamente terrible y eh, en una de las curvas, antes de ser detenidos, eh, patinamos, el coche se deslizó sobre sangre. Sobre todo había un fuego de artillería muy importante que venía del lado serbio del Drina y eh, yo vi incluso la, la, el humo que salía de las explosiones que hacen los cañones eh, cuando salen los proyectiles en about a week after Zvornik, Bosanski Shamats fell. The town was taken over with the careful planning, both by the police, the JNA, and the TO. All Serb police officers deserted the police station and left one Bosnian Croat policeman on duty, Luka Gregurovic. On the night of, on the, night of the 16th of April, Shamats was a deserted town. The restaurants were empty, and one can feel that something was about to happen. On the 17th of April, around 2 in the morning, gunshots and a loud explosion were heard in town. Bosanski Shamats was taken over by the Serb police and the Serb TO by securing government institutions, as this was reported in a report of the 17th Corps headquarters, as you can see on the screen at this moment. 
The police station was attacked and taken over, and the new chief, Stevan Todorovic, assumed his position that day. <coughs> Three weeks later, Luka Gregurovic, who was on duty, would be executed in Surkvina. On the same day, the 17th of April, the police station in Sansky Most was split among ethnic lines, and the police chief, Dragan Maikic, distributed the new R.S. Berets and had his staff sign the loyalty oath. Two days later, the SDS president, Nedel Korashula, issued an ultimatum to the SDA to vacate the municipal building, otherwise the building would come under attack. The building was indeed vacated, however, a few non-Serb policemen remained inside. At 10 o'clock in the morning on the 19th of April, the Serb Defense Forces, the SOS, attacked the municipal building and took it over. The next day, CSB Banja Luka and the Serbian news agency... Sorry, Mr. Zimbochin, I don't know if you've seen the court reporter's note. Yes, I will slow down yours. Thank you. <clears throat> the next day on the 20th of April, CSB Banja Luka and the Serbian news agency in Sarajevo were informed of this takeover by letter. On the 19th of April, Vlasenica's Serb crisis staff issued an unambiguous order entitled Decision to Take Power. On that day, all non-Serb policemen were disarmed, and the next day on the 20th of April, units of the JNA's Novi Sad Corps and a Serbian guard unit from Shekovici took control of all municipal institutions in Vlasenica. In Priedor, the accused Zhuplanin claims that the army and the crisis staff led the takeover. In fact, the takeover was organized by the Serb police and the military. Once again, the SJB chief was very candid in his end-of-year report, looking back on the achievements of his station in 1992. He wrote the following. As a result, in the night between 29 and 30 April, following very detailed preparations and pursuant to the relevant decisions of the Executive Committee of the Serbian Municipality of Priador, an organized takeover of power was embarked upon. About 400 policemen assembled in the social center at Chirkin Polje, and at 4 o'clock in the morning they took control of all important sites in town, which immediately made possible the takeover of all leading functions in the municipality, the municipal organs, and the important companies. During the month of May, Birchko was the first municipality to be taken over, on the first to be exact. It was followed by Doboy, which was taken over during the nights of the 2nd to the 3rd of May. The attack on Doboy was orchestrated by the JNA and involved volunteer detachments led by Major Stankovic, units of the 6th Motorized Brigade, Red Berets, from Serbia, led by Radovica Bozovic, and the civilian police. CSB Doboy officials had been meeting with Serb army officials for weeks prior to the takeover. The CSB chief himself was on Mount Ozren the night of the takeover, at the moment when the takeover operation began. Your honors have heard allegations that the takeover was ordered by Mr. Chazim Hajic, the 6th Motorized Brigade's commander. However, you have heard evidence that he was arrested the night of the takeover and was in fact sidelined for months prior to the takeover. This allegation is not credible. <coughs> in relation to the CSB building, Your Honors, the scenario was similar to the one uh, in Bosanski Shamats. Virtually all Serb police officers had deserted the police building, and a non-Serb policeman was left in charge of the duty service. A little after midnight, armed men entered the police building and arrested non-Serb employees and beat them up. The police entered the station the next morning 
and the Serb forces helped taking over a number of other buildings in town. As of that day, Your Honors, all non-Serb police officers were dismissed, and at least one Muslim inspector was directly informed of his dismissal by the CSB chief, Yelosevic. The last takeover which is charged in the indictment was in Kotorvaros, Juplanin's birthplace. And it was raided by the special police detachment on the 11th of June, 1992, at dawn. This trial chamber has had the rare opportunity to view a video of this takeover, and we will now look at some excerpts. Now, the first excerpt we will see in the morning hours of the 11th of June, and we can play it now, is a special unit entering the SJB building. You can see the entrance of the police station right there. You will see in a moment a number of members of the special police detachment. Now, in the second excerpt, we see the special police leaving the SJB building, and you'll notice here Luban Bayic wearing a red beret. He's one of the leaders of this special unit. Did I say Luban Bayic? My apologies. We now see one of the blue tanks used by the CSV by Aluka. Uh, similar tanks were seen on the 12th of May parade. And in a moment, we will also see the first non Serbs arrested that morning. Here, a member of the special unit orders a man to stand against the wall and show a three fingered sign. The third excerpt we will see is the special police forcing a civilian to open the trunk of his car with some brutality. In the fourth excerpt, we see the special police asking a civilian peacefully walking in the street to lay down and he kicks up. In the fifth excerpt, we now see the special police surrounding a house. As your honors will see in a moment, the special police were allegedly searching for dangerous Muslim and Croat extremists. Those are the extremists that the Bosnian Serb leadership was concerned about. In bright daylight, under no attacks, the special police easily arrested Muslim and Croat civilians. These are the dangerous extremists, Your Honors. And the last excerpt we will see on that day, the Serb flag was hoisted on the municipal police station, the SJB. Now, there are some municipalities were taken over by relatively non-violent means, as the Serb civilian and military leadership were already in a position to control the municipality. We you can see the next map, your honors will remember hearing evidence that in municipalities of Kluč, Pale, Bileća, and Teslić, non-Serb policemen were convened to meetings by their respective SJB leaders and were simply told they could no longer work in the police. Attacks on Muslim and Croat villages followed many weeks later, at a time where Serb control had already been imposed on the municipality. This pattern equally applies to municipalities not charged in the indictment, 
For example, you have heard evidence that in Bratunats, uh, all Muslims were fired from their work in mid-April 92, and all the key positions in the local government were taken over by the Serb authorities. Please slow down. Thank you. This, from the evidence, Your Honours, is a pattern of forcible takeovers throughout Bosnia and Herzegovina with a varying degree of violence, depending on the level of control exerted by the Serb authorities prior to the takeover. <coughs> I will now move on to the issue of persecutory measures imposed following the takeover. The takeover of municipalities marked the as the beginning of a period of excessive measures applied against Muslims and Croats, including large-scale arrests, unlawful detention, torture, and cruel treatment during periods of detention, killings, and other persecutory acts such as the limitation of movement and the forcible transfer and deportation of civilians. Your Honours may remember the evidence of Suleiman Tihic, the president of the SDA in Bosanski Shamans. A lawyer by profession, like most of us in this room, he had his law office in Bosanski Shamans. However, a few days after the takeover, he was arrested and suffered some of the most depraved forms of mistreatment. To add to the injury, he was publicly humiliated by being forced to sweep the streets outside the police station in the municipal building while being watched by all passers-by. In most municipalities, Your Honours, prominent Muslims and Croats were dismissed from their managerial position, and this included judges, police station commanders, company managers, etc. Setting aside managers, even employees were told they could not come to work. In Banja Luka, already in late 1991, non-Serb directors and managers, as well as factory employers, were dismissed. And in schools, teachers were already forced to use the Cyrillic script. Much later, on the 18th of June, 92, all non-Serb employees from the hospital were dismissed. We can move to the next slide. You've heard similar dismissals in Sansky Most, where Judge Adil Draganovic refused to sign a loyalty oath to the new authorities, and he was fired from his position as a judge. He also lost all his property and his house, which were torched while he was in detention. In Doboy, you heard of Edin Hadjovic, who told you that he worked for the Association of Physical Education Organizations. He was a cashier. Hadjovic was told by Jovo Popovic, the manager of this enterprise, that he and other non-Serb employees had to leave, as Popovic was told to dismiss all non-Serbs. This was shortly prior to the takeover. In the next slides, you will see Suleiman Tsanchalo. You have heard his evidence. and you've, He's told you how he was dismissed. On the 15th of May, he arrived at work at the FAMOS factory, where he had worked since 1978, and where he held the position of chief of the development department. That day, he was told by the guard at the gate that he could not enter. Some employees were allowed in, but no Muslims were allowed. Now, your honors have also heard examples of curfews in various municipalities. I will simply mention that in the municipalities of Kluch, in Doboj, in Teslic, in Gatsko, in Kotorvaros, and even in Zvornik, you have heard evidence of this curfew being announced and imposed unequally and solely against non-Serbs. I will now move on to the large-scale arrests that occurred following the takeovers. Your Honours, from one municipality to the other, Muslims and Croats were arrested and taken to local police stations where they were detained for varying periods of time. Usually, arrests started in town and focused on prominent Muslims and Croats. The aim was clear, 
By neutralizing the leadership of the non-Serb communities, the non-Serb population was paralyzed and posed no threat <coughs> to Serb ambitions. <coughs> In Pale, again you heard from Mr. Tsenchalo, that a number of Muslims were arrested randomly in the streets by the civilian police and were taken to the SJB building and were held there. In Bayaluka, you have heard of policemen in blue camouflage uniform driving around in a red van, which is also called the Red Combi, <coughs> arresting non-Serbs in the streets and beating them in the van. The doors were always left open to this van so other residents could hear the beatings and the screams. This method was used to intimidate other Muslims and Croats in the neighborhood. These were members of public and state security in Banja Luka, considered to be heroes by Stojan Juplin. In Zvornik, you heard how on the 1st of June, hundreds of Muslim civilians from the villages of Setici and Klisa were chased out of their village by the army who had surrounded it with tanks. The villagers were forced to walk to the village of Julici, where 750 men were separated from the convoy by police officers and were taken to the Karakai Technical School. In Birchko, non-Serbs were arrested throughout town and taken to various camps. For example, on the 4th of May, Yasmin Fazlovich, who worked in the fire station, was arrested with four other non-Serbs by Captain Dragan and Mirko Blagojevic. They were taken to the SJB. There, they were received by the SJB chief, Dragan Veselic, who accused them of being Green Berets and sent them to the Luka camp, where he said, you will be killed. You also heard from Islak Kashi, a former athlete, who is quite well known in Yugoslavia. He was arrested by two policemen, Dragan Pantelic and Stevo Knežević, who took him without being told the reasons for his arrest and, were and it was taken to the SJB building. After being detained there for an hour, he was taken to the Luka camp, which was situated three to four hundred meters away from the police station. It is worth noting that the Stanisic defense brief claims that the Luka camp was near Birchko. However, the evidence is clear that the camp was in Birchko. When Gashi arrived there, about 200 non-Serbs were held there. You, you also heard evidence of a similar pattern in Vogoscha, where about 470 men, women, and children were arrested following the takeover of the villages of Svrake and Semivozovac in early May 1992. If we can look at the next slide, in Bosanski Shamat, mass arrests started immediately with the takeover and were carried out throughout spring and summer of 92. On the 15th of May, the Serb municipality issued the following unequivocal decision. All people of Croatian nationality on the territory of the Serbian municipality of Bosanski Shamat shall be isolated and deployed to vital facilities in the town and in villages. The SJB chief, Todorovic, gave evidence that Croats were actually detained in such vital facilities as they knew that these were likely to be targeted by the Croatian army. Your Honor, one of the pervasive aspects of the pattern that we observed in this case was the establishment of detention facilities where civilians were held in inhumane conditions and where brutality varied only in degree. The existence of such facility in every municipality charged in the indictment is sufficient by itself to demonstrate a pattern too uniform to be ad hoc. Instead, one that must be the product of a guiding hand above the municipal level. That inescapable conclusion is only bolstered by the fact that camps were set up and run by the army, the police, the crisis staffs, all with their chain of command up to the presidency, the government, 
and more particularly to Micho Stanisic and Stoyan Zhuplatnik. The tension of civilians was systemic. Officials at all levels knew about the camps, and a Republican Exchange Commission was established from the earlier stage to monitor and control the possible release of civilians. Now, as described at paragraph 650 and 651 in our final brief, non-Serbs were detained in makeshift detention facilities from the outbreak of the conflict, and both Micho Stanisic and Stoyan Zhuplanin were aware of the existence of such facilities. In Pali, where Stanisic had his headquarters at the beginning of the conflict, Muslims and Croats were detained in an old cultural center next to the police station. Other detention centers included the movie theater and military barracks in Hrenovica. Kemal Huidur described how following the attack on Renovica in mid-May, around 25 Muslims were taken to the SJB and were beaten in front of the station. The detainees were then brought to the old cultural center where about 20 non-Serbs were already imprisoned. The beating continues there. Looking at this next map, Your Honors, you will find the 52 detention centers charged in the indictment. Of course, more camps existed in other municipalities not charged in the indictment, such as in Rogatica, Ilija, Sokolac, and Uglievik. They will not appear on this map, however. Your honors can see that detention centers were established in every one of the five regions within the RS. Of the 52, there are 48 which were established by the RS MOOP. Only two were under the jurisdiction of the Minister, Ministry of Justice. That is the Doboy Central Prison and Planyo's House, which was an annex to the Kulak Prison. Two other detention camps were established by the army, namely Manyacha and Batkovic. All other camps charged in the indictment were operated and manned by members of the civilian police on the Micho Stanisic and Stoyan Zhuka. Before I get to the conditions in these camps, Your Honors, is this an appropriate time to take a break? Yes, it appears so, Mr. Demurgi. So we would return in 20 minutes. All rise, we will event.